um, Josh. Josh is an associate professor at the MIT, at the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department at MIT since uh, 2018, but he joined there in 2013 and then became associate professor in 2018. Um, Josh did his PhD with in at Harvard, uh, sorry, his bachelor's at Harvard with Nancy Canvisher, where he actually worked on some of the most groundbreaking work on the fuse form phase area. Um, and then he did an MPhil in computational neuroscience with Geoff Hinton. Um, and then in between two gigs at Nature Neuroscience as an editor, he got his PhD at MIT with uh, Ted Adelson. Uh, and since then, he, he did a bunch of uh, postdocs and research positions at Minnesota, NYU, and Oxford, where he started off his auditory, auditory research program working, and he's done some groundbreaking work on pitch, music, auditory perception, grouping, et cetera, that I've been looking at with great interest for almost more than a decade now. He has won numerous awards. He's also the, and I'll just mention one, he's the winner of the 2018 Troll and Research Award. And uh, Josh, all it's yours now. Um, we are really looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, we were just discussing um, when, I, when I got on how to handle questions. And um, I think what might work well is if people can type questions into the chat and then Suresh is gonna monitor that and he'll interject uh, when as seems appropriate because I won't be able to see it myself. Um, but feel free to ask questions of clarification. Um, if it seems like it's going to take longer, maybe we can hold that off to the end, and I'll, I'll try to leave some time for discussion. Um, so thank you very much for, for having me. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work trying to understand human hearing, and it's usually useful to start by just doing some listening. So what I want to do here is just play you an example of like typical auditory input so that we can get on the same page with respect to the, the problem that we're talking about. So just please close your eyes and listen to this. Okay, so that was nothing special. It's just like something random that I recorded on my phone. Um, and I could make similar points about almost anything that I would record like during the course of, of daily life. And the point of playing you that is just to sort of point out the like amazing thing that is happening all the time, like when we listen, that is like so routine that we sometimes lose sight of how remarkable it is. Um, and that is that you were able to listen to that sound and tell that that was a recording that was made in a cafe. You could probably tell that there were a few different people talking. You tell a couple of them were women. There was, a, there was also a man. If you hear music in the background, you could have nod your head to the beat, hear dishes clattering, all that stuff, right? So you're inferring an enormous amount of information about the world from the sound. Um, and you're doing that with sensory input that to first order just looks like this. So there's a sound waveform, it makes your way to your ear, it causes pressure variation at your eardrum and that causes your eardrum to wiggle back and forth in a particular pattern. Um, and just from that particular pattern of wiggles, you're able to infer that you're, you're listening to all that stuff in the world. Um, and so as a listener, you're, you're interested in what happened in the world to cause the sound. And the problem is interesting because most of the properties that we are interested in uh, as organisms are not explicit in the waveform in the sense that if I show you a picture of the sound waveform or if I give it to you in digital form and I let you run some simple classifiers on it, you would have a difficult time telling me what happened in the world to cause the sound, right? We think that's why you need a brain. One of the things that your brain does is it takes that sensory input and it transforms it through cascades of computations into a format in which it's easier to read out the kinds of things that matter to you. All right, so that's really the, the central question that my research group uh, is concerned with, how we derive information about the world um, from sound. So our sense of hearing is quite powerful, um, but it's also quite fragile. Um, this is kind of a, a depressing graph, at least from the standpoint of a middle-aged guy like me, um, that shows the onset of hearing loss with age. So this graph is plotting the average human audiogram. Uh, and so an audiogram is the thing that they, they measure when you go to the doctor and they play you little beeps and you have to raise your hand or press a button when you hear the beep. And so th those beeps will be pure tones so that those are sinusoids at different frequencies and they're measuring your detection thresholds or how intense the sound has to be for you to detect it. Um, and so this is the average um, audiogram for a human. And actually, um, can I just ask you, can you all see my mouse arrow? Can you give me thumbs up if you can see that mouse moving around? Okay, yep, great. Yeah, we can. Um, so this graph is plotting the average human audiogram. Um, and so the, the x-axis here is frequency. So the, the thresholds are measured at a bunch of different frequencies. And then the y-axis is plotting um, the elevation in your thresholds. So that's um, dBHL here in decibels. And it's plotted separately for 
each of a bunch of different age groups. And so you can see that like when you're in your 20s or 30s, um, the threshold elevation is at zero, which means that your hearing is about, on average, about as good as it would be in a, a young baby. Okay? Um, but thereafter, with each successive uh, increment in age, the thresholds are elevated. Um, and, and there are no error bars on these graphs just to sort of avoid clutter. Um, and the data sample is finite. Um, but you can see that in general, as you get older, the thresholds kind of go up. And so, you know, by the time somebody's in their, their 60s or 70s, especially at high frequencies, you have 30 to 40 dB of hearing loss um, on average. Okay. And that's pretty substantial. It's kind of like the difference between having a quiet conversation and shouting. Um, so this is a massive public health problem. Uh, the treatment of choice is hearing aids. They work okay if you're in a quiet environment, um, are not very effective when you're in noisy environments. Um, and so it'd be really great to have better solutions to this public health problem. But really our ability to engineer those solutions is, is limited by our understanding of, of how we hear when we have normal healthy hearing. So I run a research group at MIT called the Lab for Computational Audition. We work at the intersection of psychology and neuroscience and engineering. And our, our long-term goal is to build good predictive models of human hearing. And what I mean by that is that I'd like to end up with a computer program that can take sound as input and then can make all the kinds of judgments that a person can make with sound. And so we think that if we're successful in that research program, it will transform our ability to make people hear better, whether they have impaired hearing or whether they, they have what we can, would consider to be um, normal, healthy hearing. All right, so that's just sort of the setting for what we're, where we're, we're, we're trying to head. Now, from where I sit, um, what we call the peripheral auditory system, so essentially the, the ear and the associated structures, is pretty well characterized. Um, and this is a, an old picture of the ear. We have the outer ear known as the pinna, that sound is funneled down the ear canal, causes your eardrum here to uh, vibrate back and forth. Those vibrations are transmitted via these three little bones called the ossicles. These are the three smallest bones in your body. And the, the vibrations then are transmitted to the cochlea, which is this thing here that looks kind of like a snail. Um, and so that's the organ that does the sensory transduction for hearing that takes the mechanical vibrations that come in as sound and turns those into electrical signals that are transmitted uh, up the auditory nerve to your brain. And so one of the the like signature features of cochlear transduction was discovered a long time ago, and many of you probably remember from undergraduate classes, uh, is that it's frequency tuned. Um, so this is another picture here of, of the cochlea. It's kind of been unwrapped a little bit for clarity. You can see that it's got like a, a few of these tubes that are filled with fluid, and then they're separated by um, the, the, a membrane here, the basilar membrane. Um, and so sound comes in at the base of the cochlea and sets up vibrations along the membrane. Um, and, because the physical properties of the membrane vary along its length, so it changes in thickness and stiffness, the resonant frequency of the membrane varies depending on where you are. And so the consequence of that is that if you pipe in a high frequency, the vibrations tend to peak near the base. You pipe in a medium frequency, they peak in the, peak in the middle. And if you pipe in a low frequency, they tend to peak up near the apex, right? So the cochlea is kind of taking sound and breaking it up into different frequency bands, the first order. And so the auditory nerve fibers that are synapsing different places along the cochlea end up being frequency tuned. And so we now have like pretty standard peripheral models of, the, of, of the, this part of the auditory system that everybody in the field works with. Like this is one version that we use a lot in my lab that is especially simple where you have a sound waveform that gets passed through a bank of bandpass filters. So these are transfer functions of the filters. So on the x-axis, it would be frequency and the y-axis would be the response of the filter. So this one would be tuned to a low frequency and this one would be tuned to a high frequency. And this is the output of the filter. And then usually there's a nonlinear operation um, that extracts sort of like the instantaneous amplitude or something approximating it in each frequency channel. And that um, we, we think is representative of the information that would be encoded in the firing rates in an auditory nerve fiber. So this is one pretty simple model. Um, there are now like way more complicated models that actually like model with pretty good quantitative success, like the details of, of the responses in the auditory nerve. And there's a few um, groups that have worked on this like Laurel Carney and, and Ian Bruce. Um, and this is an example schematic from one of those. Um, and the, the details of this like, are not really critical for our purposes. The point is like it's a pretty complicated model um, that works quite well at predicting the responses of the ear. All right. So in, in our lab, most of the time, um, we're interested in understanding what happens downstream. 
Um, and what I'm going to tell you about today are, is our work over the last five years or so, looking into whether we can obtain better models of the downstream auditory system using machine learning. And the, the motivation for this approach is kind of um, shown in this picture here, where, as I said, we feel like we have a pretty good understanding of the cochlea. Um, and that's in part because of decades of research. It's, it's very, well, uh, very well explored um, and it's towards the front end of the system. And maybe for that reason, it's just a little bit easier to account for with, with models. And of course, there's like lots and lots of experiments that characterize aspects of the downstream auditory system. But I would argue that they are really not nearly enough to actually determine uh, the characteristics of a quantitative model that can predict what people are going to do. All right. So we've essentially got this like unknown thing in here, which is the rest of the auditory system. That's not that well constrained by the available experimental data. Um, and then we, we, we know using that system, we can make different kinds of judgments. Okay. Um, so we don't know a whole lot about what happens in, in, inside here. Um, but we do know that sound is generated by the world. Okay. And the world is a lawful place governed by physics. And the consequence of that is that the sounds that we listen to um, are highly structured and very, very far from being fully random. All right, and it seems plausible that that places a pretty big constraint on the system that we have to process those sounds. Um, and we also know a fair bit about the behaviors that our auditory system can mediate in the sense that we can recognize sounds and tell where they're coming from in the world, things like that. All right, so this is kind of the setup where like we, we don't know a whole lot about what's going on in here. Um, but we know a fair bit about the world and we can make lots of measurements of sounds and we know a fair bit about auditory behaviors. And so the question that we've been exploring is to what extent is the auditory system constrained by the demands of real world sounds and tasks? Okay. So the question that we're gonna ask here is if we train a system in order to perform tasks on natural sounds, and in our cases, we'll be using neural networks just because that's the current methodology that works pretty well for that sort of thing. Um, will we be able to actually account for a lot of behaviors of uh, the human auditory system? So it's now pretty routine, as everybody probably knows, to get human level performance on a lot of different perceptual tasks using artificial neural networks. Uh, the basic ingredients of these models have been around for a very long time. They consist of repeated applications of a set of pretty simple operations, filtering, pooling, normalization. A lot of these things were originally sort of inspired by things that people observed in biology. Um, and we now have very effective methods of optimizing the parameters of these models uh, to uh, enable them to classify input signals. And so as everybody here no doubt knows over the last eight years, there's been a total transformation in the way that people do engineering. Essentially every aspect of engineering now involves what, what we call deep learning in one way or another. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of interest um, within neuroscience and other areas of biology and whether like this could be harnessed potentially to build better models of, uh, of the brain and other things that we study. Um, so the approach that we take uh, when we do this is to typically hardwire a model of the cochlea to be faithful to what we know from biology. And again, the logic behind that is that we, we know a fair amount about that stage of the system. We, we think the models that we have there are like pretty good. Um, and so we can kind of just like hardwire in that, that part of the system. Um, and then we try to learn all the subsequent stages um, and then investigate its characteristics. Okay. Um, so this, is, this sort of approach has sort of received a fair bit of attention within certain corners of neuroscience. Um, there's also like a lot of very widely discussed limitations, um, which are important to keep in mind. So um, everybody agrees, I think, that the kind of learning that happens when we do this sort of machine learning is not really a realistic account of biological learning. And although these models are, call, are called neural networks, in part because they were originally inspired by observations in biology, they're really not very neural. neural. Um, and so they're not very well suited to circuit level models. Um, that's what a lot of people would say, including myself. Um, and um, although, as we'll see, one of the strengths of these models is that they can instantiate some pretty interesting behaviors, um, the behavior is, off, is, is typically limited to the, the classification tasks that you train them on. Um, so, and, and there's a lot of other limitations like this, and lots of people write about this and discuss this, and so I, I won't dwell on it at any length. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that. Um, but it's also the case that, at least at the moment, um, deep learning um, enables us to optimize hierarchical models for real world tasks. And so that has sort of opened the door to building optimized models and domains where it really wasn't possible before. 
So what I want to tell you about today um, is to start out by giving you a summary of some of the recent successes of our neural network models of hearing. Um, and then um, I'm going to end with talking a little bit about some of the current model shortcomings, which are, are fairly significant. All right, so one of the uh, first tasks that we started investigating in this way was um, speech recognition. So th this is partly because speech recognition is obviously a pretty important thing that you do with your auditory system. And it's also a domain that had been a focus of a lot of engineering re re research over many, many decades. And so as a consequence, um, there were quite a lot of labeled corpora that were available. Um, and so when you do this thing that we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you about where we're training models to perform tasks using what's called supervised learning, you typically need labeled data sets. Um, and so speech was an area where there were a bunch of uh, sets of recordings of speech where people had annotated the words that were being said. So we took a bunch of these corpora um, and came up with, our, uh, with a task that suited our needs. So we have excerpts of speech and those are superimposed on background noise that comes from a variety of sources. We used music, um, speech babble, which is like a crowd of people talking, um, recordings of city streets, things like that. Um, and the, um, the model here is going to see two second excerpts of speech, and the task that, um, that I'll be showing you, you now is um, to, to say what the word is at the middle of the, uh, the audio clip. Um, so in this case, um, this is an excerpt from a classic speech corpora called the Wall Street Journal Corpus. The person's talking about the gross domestic product, um, and so the target word here would be domestic. So this is an example of the stimulus. Gross domestic product grew one so hopefully you could hear them say domestic. This is classically the kind of thing that would have been a very challenging problem in speech recognition because there's background noise um, and the speech is highly variable, but it's now the kind of thing that's like pretty, pretty straightforward to actually build systems to um, succeed on. Um, and so in the version of uh, this that I'll be telling you about, there were approximately 600 different um, possible words that could occur there in the middle. Um, so the approach that we take uh, when we are building these models is like by now, like very standard. Um, so the weights are learned via backpropagation. We always do, or usually we do some kind of automated optimization of uh, the architectural hyperparameters. So whenever you build one of these models, there's a, a lot of choices that you have to make in terms of like um, the sequence of operations and things like the size of the filter kernels and what type of pooling you do and stuff like that. Um, and that can make a big difference. And so oftentimes if you're working in some domain um, where lots of people have done related work, you can just like borrow an architecture that somebody had good success on. Um, but oftentimes we're working in domains where people haven't really built a whole lot of models. And so it's usually important to do some kind of search over the, the space of architectures in order to find something that works okay. So we usually do that. And then um, there's, there's two other kind of big like assumptions or, or, or constraints in the way that we do this that are noteworthy. Um, the first is that um, for the most part, we work with models that are convolutional in both time and frequency. And so that means that we have like the output of our cochlear model as shown here. Um, and this is typically represented as like an image where time is on one axis and frequency is on the other axis. Um, and the, the subsequent neural network in, is performing convolutional operations in both time and frequency domain. Um, uh, dimensions. Um, and a lot of people find this counterintuitive. Um, so it makes a lot of sense in, um, in the time domain, just because that's sort of what a, what a filter ought to do over time. Um, but convolution and frequency sort of implies that you're actually measuring the same quantity at all different frequencies in your signal. And that th doesn't obviously make a whole lot of sense because high and low frequencies are pretty different things. Um, we have nonetheless found empirically that things work a lot better when you uh, use that as a model constraint. Um, and my guess is that that's because it, although it's probably not exactly the right thing to do, um, it's actually like pretty close to, or at least it's closer to the right thing to do than like a lot of the other things that you might try. Um, and my suspicion is that it works well in part because um, there is some local translation invariance along the frequency axis. Um, and uh, that impo imposing that as, as a form of regularization just ends up being pretty helpful. Um, so that's one thing that we do. And the other thing that I should say is that so far, um, we have worked on domains where the phenomena are kind of relatively local in time. And so the, um, the input to the models are typically pr relatively short um, segments of sound. So usually about two seconds. Um, and as a consequence of that, we're neglecting important effects of time, the directionality of time, effects of memory that are no doubt important when you're dealing with longer time skills. And so it's a, a very interesting 
next step, I think, to try to incorporate that. Um, but what I'll tell you about today doesn't do that yet. All right, and our initial work in this domain um, was led by Alex Kell, shown here. He was a grad student in the lab. He's now a postdoc at Columbia. Um, and Dan Yamans, who was a postdoc um, at MIT that did some work with me, and he's now um, got his own lab at Stanford. And so what I want to show you here, just um, for starters, um, is a behavioral comparison of the neural network model and humans on the same task. And so this is a speech recognition task where you got to recognize speech and it's superimposed on noise. And so what I'm going to show you on this graph is what humans do. Um, so the graph plots proportion correct on the y-axis uh, versus the signal to noise ratio on the x-axis. And so as you move um, from left to right, um, the speech is sort of getting louder relative to the noise. And so you would expect that people are going to do better. Um, and indeed they do. Um, but you can also see that uh, it's a lot easier to recognize speech when it's superimposed on some kinds of noise than others. So it's way easier to recognize speech on top of instrumental music. That's the cyan curve than on top of crowd noise, which is the purple curve. All right, so that's just what people do. Um, so um, this is the same experiment, but run on the model. And here's what happens. And there's sort of two things to note about this. The first is that the model is doing about as well as people. Um, that's the kind of thing that just would have been hard to obtain 10 years ago, but now it's pretty commonplace. But the other thing that's kind of interesting is that the relative difficulty of the different conditions is like fairly consistent um, from the model to, to humans. And the thing that I will note about this, um, and this will apply to everything that I'm going to show you today, um, is that the, the model is not fit to match human behavior. Okay, so what happens here is we have a system and we optimize it to perform a task uh, the system is then frozen and then we just run it on experiments and this is just what it does, okay? Um, so any match that you see between the model and human data um, is a side effect of optimization for the task. Okay, so this was really the first result of this nature that we we uh, observed and that, that got our attention and made us think that this was something that was worth pursuing. Um, and we have, have now seen kind of analogous results in like a lot of other domains. Um, one that we're pretty excited about at the moment is sound localization. Um, so everybody realizes probably that you have some ability to localize sounds. Um, it's a pretty interesting problem though, because unlike in vision where the location of an object in the world is to some extent made explicit on your retina because your retina forms an image that is spatial in nature, the spatial location of a sound source is actually not really made explicit in your ear. Now, your ear generates a map of frequency, but not a map of space. Um, there are nonetheless cues that give you information about a sound's location. Um, and two of those are binaural. So in this example here, if the sound source is to your right, the sound will arrive at the right ear a little bit before the left ear. And that causes a time difference between the sound that's entering the two ears. Um, and this, the head will also cast an acoustic shadow, which will mean that often the sound that is at the left ear will be lower in amplitude than the sound that is at the right ear. So we have those interaural time and level differences or ITDs and ILDs um, that have been known about for many, many decades. Um, and we also now know that uh, one of the things that enables you to localize in the vertical dimension is the fact that the pinna, so this is the floppy thing on the outside of your head, it's got these sort of funny folds in it. And that has the consequence of filtering sounds that colors their spectra in a way that is dependent on where they come from. And so these little pictures are showing the, spec, the, the transfer function of the ear as a function of uh, where the sound is coming from in elevation. And you can see that there are these, um, these, these funny little troughs in the transfer function and they're in different places, different frequencies, depending on the, the location, all right? So that again has been pretty well characterized, known about for many decades at this point. All right, so this stuff is in all the textbooks. Um, but it, it's also the case that the problem of localizing in real world conditions is complicated. So real world environments, they always have noise. Um, they also always have reflections. Um, and so reflections are a real challenge for sound localization because they typically come from the wrong direction. Um, um, and so they're a real source of, of potential confusion. So the, the upshot is that localization in realistic conditions is a hard problem. And we've never as a field really had models that can actually localize sounds. Okay. So Andrew Francel is a grad student in our lab who tried to build such a model. Um, and to do this, um, he made use of a, a virtual training environment. So took advantage of the fact that we, we know a fair amount about room acoustics. And so there are computer programs that can simulate like what rooms will do to sounds. 
And so this picture kind of shows how it works. So we um, select a natural sound source and some noise sources, and then render the sound that would enter the ears of a person at a particular location, in this case here, if they were listening to um, a sound at this location with some noise sources at these black locations. And so the room simulator outputs stereo audio, so two audio signals, one for the left ear and one for the right ear. Uh, we then pass that into models of the cochlea, and then that provides the input to a neural network that has to classify uh, the sound's location in terms of um, azimuth, that's along the horizontal dimension, and elevation along the vertical dimension. Okay. So the virtual training environment is essentially what allows us to get enough labeled data that we can apply supervised learning to the problem. Now, the fact that it's trained in this virtual environment sort of might make you wonder, well, is this thing going to actually work in real world conditions? And so Andrew tested that. Um, and so to do that, he generated a, a test set of recordings that are made in the ears of a mannequin. So this is a standard mannequin that's used in hearing science, science called the Kimar mannequin, which is sort of a, a, intended to model the acoustic effects of like the head and torso and outer ears. And it's got little microphones inside its, uh, its fake ears. So he made these recordings in our lab space of sound sources coming from like different positions relative to the mannequin. Um, and then what was pretty cool is that he just supplies the, the binaural waveforms as input to the model um, and the model does fine. Um, so that's what's shown here on the right. So this is a plot of the actual position of the source in our lab. And this is the judged position. And you can see that like all the mass here is along the diagonal. Okay, so even though this thing was trained in this virtual environment, it actually transfers um, to the real world, which is kind of cool. So we actually have a model now that can localize sounds um, from using biological cues uh, in real world settings. And so then the question that we asked was, does the model reproduce the characteristics of spatial hearing? And so we took advantage of the fact that people have been studying sound localization for many, many decades. There's like this huge, beautiful library of work that you can draw from. Um, and this slide is, is a little bit overwhelming, but is an example of a, of a bunch of experiments that people have done that characterize spatial hearing or sound localization in different ways. Um, and if you were somebody who studies spatial hearing, you'd know each one of these results. Um, if you're not, you won't be familiar with this, and that's okay. Um, the details are not really critical for our, our purposes. Um, the point is just that these are all experiments that kind of characterize how people are able to localize sounds in different kinds of conditions. All right. All right. So this is all human data. Um, and so what we did is we sort of reproduced these, these experiments on our model. And the, and the way that that works is like you render the, uh, the stimulus, you supply it as input to the model, it gives you a localization judgment, and then you can generate a results graph. Um, and hopefully you can kind of see by just glancing between the top and the bottom here, um, that in all these different cases, um, the model is reproducing qualitatively and in many cases quantitatively uh, the effects that are observed in humans. Um, and this is all described in more detail in the, uh, this paper that just came out like a month ago. All right, so the upshot here is that we've got a model now um, that can localize sounds in real world uh, conditions and that also reproduces the behavioral phenotype of human spatial hearing. Um, and so you might wonder, okay, well, so that's fine, but what does this really tell us? Like, what's the scientific contribution? Um, you know, and in, in some of these cases, people had very well-developed intuitions for why human hearing exhibited like the, the effects that it does. Um, and the model is sort of providing a confirmation of some of those intuitions. But there are a lot of other cases where sometimes there's experimental results that are just results that people don't really have a good understanding of. Um, and so one example of that that I'll just show you here um, is what happens when people have to localize more than one thing at once. So this is an experiment that was done by um, Zhang and Yost a few years ago. So you have a human that's sitting in the middle of this array of speakers and some number of the speakers play a, a sound. In this case, it's somebody talking. Okay? Um, and the person has to indicate um, which of the speakers is playing a sound. Um, and so what you find when you do this on humans um, is that humans do okay up to about three sound sources. Um, and after that, they, they fall off. So this is a graph that plots the actual number of sources that are, were presented versus the number of sources that a, a human reported. And so you can see for one, two, and three, they're pretty accurate. And then after that, they sort of start missing sounds, okay? So this was a, a result that, um, I mean, so we, we had known for a very long time that people were sort of limited in multi-source localization. This was a measurement of this from not that long ago, but as I said, it's sort of just a result. Like we don't really know why this limit is the way that it is. And you could tell a lot of different stories about this. Like one story might be that, well, 
you know, maybe in order to localize sounds, people have to be able to pay attention to them. And we often think within cognitive psychology that people have limits on how many things they can attend to. And so that could plausibly be why you kind of cap out at about three. Um, could also just be that like, once you have more than three sources, the, the cues kind of start to interfere with each other. It's a little hard to know. But what we found when we simulated this experiment on the model is that you get like a very, very similar curve, okay? So the model is able to kind of accurately localize about three things and thereafter it kind of starts missing sources. Okay? And so this suggests that this limit on human hearing is really intrinsic to the problem because we find that when we take a, a machine system, when we optimize it for the problem of sound localization, we end up with a very similar limitation. All right. And so that's one of the kinds of things that, that we feel like we can learn from this approach is sort of an understanding why certain properties uh, of hearing are the way that they are. All right. So that's sound localization. Another domain where we have looked at this kind of thing is the domain of pitch perception. Um, so pitch is within hearing science um, normally thought of as the perceptual correlate of the fundamental frequency of a sound or, or the rate of repetition. So it's really important in, in speech and music because many of the sounds in speech and music are periodic. Um, and so the fundamental frequency is like a key variable that defines those sounds. Um, and so Mark Sadler and Ray Gonzalez in our lab built a model of pitch perception by a training a neural network to estimate fundamental frequency of excerpts of speech or music superimposed on noise. So again, it goes through a cochlear model and then there's a neural network that has to classify the fundamental frequency of the sound. So they train this thing up and uh, it learns to do the task. Um, and then they ask kind of a similar question to what we posed um, in the thing I just showed you about sound localization, which is, well, People have been studying pitch perception forever. There's like a very long list of experiments that characterize the, uh, the detailed characteristics of that. And these are five uh, uh, such examples. Um, so again, if you were a pitch researcher, you would like know and love each one of these experiments. Um, if you're not, the details again are not really critical for the main point I wanna make. Each one of these is just a way of measuring the effect of different stimulus variables on the ability to to estimate or discriminate fundamental frequency. All right, so it's just, it's a bunch of results. And so Mark and Ray, they took these experiments and they ran them on their model. Um, and what they found is that, again, qualitatively, and in many cases, quantitatively, um, the model reproduces these effects that you see in humans, okay? Okay, so um, I, I've just shown you some examples here in the domains of speech recognition, sound localization, and pitch perception. Um, where we're able to reproduce a, a bunch of aspects of human behavior. And so from my perspective, like this is a pretty major advance over previous generations of models and that we're able to get human-like behavior out of them. And this is true in realistic conditions. Uh, we get comparable accuracy. And for the most part, we see similar psychophysics, which indicates a uh, similar use of cues. Um, and so this is suggestive um, that human-like behavior is really emerging merely from uh, as a consequence of task optimization. Um, and so one of the, the doors that this has opened for us is it allows us to investigate the conditions that produce human-like behavior. So just to, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, I'm gonna, gonna go back to the thing I just showed you where we have this model of pitch perception, where we find that the, a model that is trained on natural sounds of so speech and music reproduces a variety of behavioral characteristics that we see in humans. Um, and so to test whether the learned strategy that is embodied in like all of these results is somehow adapted to the natural environment, um, we can instead train the system on a different training set. So in this case, we're going to optimize the system to estimate fundamental frequency from unnatural synthetic tones. In this case, that will have high pass spectrum. So it turns out that like one of the the most basic statistical properties of natural sounds is that the spectra tend to be low pass. So the power at low frequencies is usually higher than the power at high frequencies. And so the black curve shown here is the power spectrum on at the average power spectrum of speech and music sounds. So you can see that, that it, it's sort of higher at low frequencies and then falls off um, at high frequencies. And so we generated an alternative training set um, that instead has this property that there's more power at high frequencies than low frequencies. And so we trained the thing up on this alternative training set and then ran it on this set of experiments. And what I'm gonna do now is flip back and forth between these two sets of results. And hopefully you'll be able to see 
um, that you get very different looking psychophysical results for a system that is optimized on a different type of sound, okay? So it's learning to estimate fundamental frequency, but it's doing it in a way that really deviates from what you see in humans, okay? Um, and if you wanna learn more about this, there's a, a paper on this that came out uh, recently. Okay, so this is sort of suggesting that um, you're seeing human-like results only when you're kind of optimizing for natural sounds. Um, and we've found something pretty similar and interesting in the domain of sound localization, uh, where the model again really only resembles humans or resembles them closely if you optimize it for natural conditions. And so in this case, we took advantage of the fact that we had this virtual training environment um, and we could make these changes to the environment that would really not be possible um, in real world conditions. And then ask like, what would the auditory system be like if we had evolved and developed potentially in some very different kind of world uh, with, with different physical properties. So one of the changes that we made is we got rid of reflections. So that's uh, what we call anechoic training. So the environment is anechoic. So that's what would happen if every surface um, that sound uh, impinges on completely absorbs the, the sound. We also got rid of background noise. Um, and, then, and then the third condition, we made the, the sound sources unnatural. All right, so you take these different worlds, you train the system up to learn to localize sounds in these alternative worlds. Um, and then we ran it on that same suite of experiments and ask, is that model similar to human hearing? And this is an aggregate measure of that. So this graph is plotting uh, the human model dissimilarity that's kind of pooled across all of the experiments that we had, our, um, we had access to. Um, for the, this is what you get for the normal condition. Um, and I should say that we don't expect this to be all the way at zero because the human data is not perfectly reliable. Um, and this is just what you get. Um, and the, the important point though, is that in all of these three unnatural conditions, the dissimilarity is substantially higher. Okay, so when we change the, tr the, the training environment to deviate from the natural world, we end up with a system that is less human-like. Okay. So again, it's suggesting that human behavior is at least to some substantial extent, a consequence of the demands of being well optimized for the natural world. Okay, now the, the, the thing that I mentioned at the start um, may be uh, occurring to you as, as relevant to this as well, which is that I told you that normally what we do is we have this constraint on our model that there's a hardwired model of the cochlea um, that is sort of modeled after what we see in the ear. Um, and it's natural to wonder whether that actually matters. And um, there are, there's one example so far where we have looked at this in some detail, um, which is this model of pitch perception. Um, so Josh, so can ask, ask, please. Can I have a quick question? Uh, it's just a clarification one from Eric Cook. Is yep. the input to the ANN models always the output of the cochlear model? I um, mean, everything that I've shown you so far, yes. Okay. That's and um, that what, what I'm going to tell what I'm going to show you now is, is an instance where that wasn't the case. Okay. Um, right. So it's natural to wonder, like what 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 is the uh, the effect of of that built-in cochlear model on behavior, right? Um, and so we've looked at this so far in the domain of pitch perception, um, where what we did is we got rid of the the cochlear model and we replaced that with a bank of learnable filters. Um, and so the, the input to the model now is sound waveforms. Um, it can learn a set of 1D filters, and then every, the, the, the other aspects of the model are exactly the same as they were before. Okay, so it's the same like um, uh, backbone, um, but with a different front end that is now learnable. Okay, um, and what happened is pretty interesting, um, which is that without the hard-coded cochlea, um, the model learns a solution that is a, a little bit inhuman. Um, and so this is one experiment that kind of shows that. So the, the results of human, running humans on this one experiment, again, the details of the experiment don't really matter for our purposes, but the results of running humans on, are shown on the left. Um, the model with the hard-coded cochlea um, uh, uh, is shown in the middle, um, and that kind of qualitatively resembles what you see in humans. And then the model with the learned cochlea um, is shown on the right, um, and that, uh, that looks pretty different in a few different ways. Okay. Um, so that is some evidence that actually the, the cochlea matters in this case. And my interpretation of this would be that the, the cochlea is constrained by a lot of different natural behaviors, right? So the cochlea doesn't just have to be good for pitch perception. It's got to be good for speech recognition and sound localization and all the other many things that we do with our auditory system. 
um, such that the cochlea really is more of a constraint on pitch perception than the other way around, okay? Um, such that if you learn a cochlea that is specialized just to estimate fundamental frequency, um, it ends up not really resembling the biological cochlea. And as a consequence of that, the pitch behavior that comes out of that deviates from human behavior. So this raises the natural question of like, what details about the cochlea matter? Um, and so this is um, something that we have started to kind of look at um, and it's turned out to be pretty interesting. And um, this is a picture here of a simulation of the auditory nerve in response to a harmonic tone. Um, and so remember, we can kind of think of the cochlea as this frequency decomposition of sound. And so we often uh, represent that with an image where we have time on one axis and frequency on the other axis. And in this case, you can kind of think of you know, each of these rows as being an auditory nerve fiber. And it's characterized by a characteristic frequency, which is like the, the preferred frequency um, to first order for that nerve fiber. And so this is a harmonic tone. And so the spectrum of the tone is shown over here on the left. So it's got a bunch of discrete frequencies. This is the time waveform up here at the top. So if you take the response of the auditory nerve and you kind of just average it over time, um, you get something that people usually call an excitation pattern. Um, and if you look at the excitation pattern for a sound um, like, like a harmonic sound that's got a bunch of discrete frequencies, you will see that there are these discrete um, peaks and valleys in the excitation pattern. So you got a peak here that corresponds to the first harmonic, another peak here, that's the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth, and so on and so forth. And then eventually that kind of peters out, okay? All right, and so um, this variation in excitation with place um, that mirrors the stimulus frequencies is something that lots of people have posited might really underlie pitch perception. But if you look at the, uh, the response of the auditory nerve that's shown here, you can also see that there's this very fine-grained temporal variation in the response. Okay? And that's due to a property of the auditory nerve that's called phase locking. Um, and it actually has its roots in the inner hair cells um, that change their membrane potential in, uh, when they vibrate in response to sound. Um, so they, they have this amazing ability to actually time lock their membrane potential to the mechanical vibrations of the basilar membrane. But there are biophysical limits to how fast the ion channels can open and close. And so phase locking really, we think mostly only exists up to about four kilohertz in, in most mammals. We don't really know for sure in humans. But at low frequencies, you do see this like pretty exquisite um, phase locking of the spikes in response to, uh, to sound. Okay. And so there are like these longstanding um, debates in the field um, over the extent to which this temporal information here via phase locking really matters for pitch perception and like other aspects of perception. Um, and it's been a very difficult thing to, to test in part because it's like sort of hard to get at the auditory nerve and um, certainly not in humans. So you're, it's hard to do kind of causal perturbations. So we thought that our models would be an interesting way to look at this um, because what we can do is we can take the cochlear model and we can actually kind of cause it to have much worse phase locking. So the hair cells that are in this model, they have a, a low pass cutoff. Um, and so in the case on the left, that low pass cutoff is kind of set to what we think of as, as a plausible value um, for the mammalian ear. So around 3000 Hertz, but we can kind of lower that to 50 Hertz. And you can see that that causes the, um, the activity to kind of get smeared out in time. So the excitation pattern, the like time averaged response of the cochlea along the, the place axis or tonotopic axis, that's unchanged, um, but the phase locking is, is now absent. And so we can ask, well, if we take a neural network and we now optimize it for this altered cochlea, um, is it still gonna resemble humans or, or will the behavioral phenotype be altered in some way? Um, and what we see is pretty clear, um, which is, is, and that's shown here. Um, so this is again, this one particular experiment that is measuring uh, the effect of one variable on on the ability to discriminate fundamental frequency, the details are not critical. And the, but the graph on the right is showing four different models. They're each optimized for different cochlear models. Um, the red curve is the one that has the upper limit of phase locking that we think is kind of biologically correct, at least as best we know. Um, and then each of the other models has a limit that's progressively lower. And you can see that as you lower that limit, um, you end up with, a a results graph that really deviates pretty substantially from what you see in humans. And so in particular, like with this blue curve where there's really no appreciable phase locking for um, this, these kind of stimuli, um, 
you really don't see much ability to extract pitch uh, without the fundamental present. So that's called the missing fundamental illusion. It's sort of a, an important thing in pitch perception and the models don't seem to have that if they don't have access to phase locking. So I think this is like some pretty interesting evidence um, that phase locking is really critical for, for human pitch perception because if you don't give a model access to that, um, it's really difficult to, at least in our hands, to get out human-like pitch behavior. Okay. Um, so we also have um, some evidence that phase locking is really critical for invariance to intensity, but I think in the interest of time, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna skip over this result. So the, the sort of top level message that I hope you come away from for um, this bit of the talk um, is that behavioral traits of audition appear to be very strongly constrained by real world sounds and tasks along with our cochlea such that if we take a machine system when we optimize it just with the constraints of natural sounds and natural tasks and a cochlea, um, we are often emerging with a system that is uh, reproducing a lot of important characteristics of human hearing. Um, and so the, the approach that we're taking here, um, it's conceptually very similar to a classical approach in perceptual science known as ideal observer models. And the idea there is that if you, um, if you have a particular task, um, you can analytically derive um, the optimal solution to the task. Um, and so historically, this, is, this was something that uh, was, was pr pretty widely used um, and it's useful in a lot of ways, but it's also like very tightly restricted to tasks that are simple um, in order, and, and that enable you to actually analytically derive optimal solutions. And so what these, these new methods in machine learning have enabled us to do is sort of something that's conceptually analogous because we can optimize systems for these pretty complicated real world tasks where it would be pretty hopeless to analytically derive an ideal observer. Now, of course, the systems that we get out are not provably ideal. In fact, they're surely not ideal, um, but they might be close enough um, to actually give us some useful insights and they're applicable to domains where deriving an ideal observer would be intractable. Okay, so that's kind of the, an approach that we're excited about. All right, so the take home messages here from this first little bit of the talk um, which is actually the, the bulk of the talk, don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish real soon, um, is that after training on natural auditory tasks with natural sounds, uh, we get pretty good matches to uh, human behavioral experience in a bunch of different domains. So speech recognition and noise, sound localization and pitch perception. Um, I didn't tell you about this today, but we also find that the models that result give us the best current predictions of uh, responses that we measure in the brain and the auditory cortex. Um, and then I showed you some examples of how manipulation of the training conditions um, can give us um, insights into the origins of human behavioral traits. So the similarity that we see with human behavior um, is pretty clearly a function of optimization for natural tasks and sounds um, and uh, a cochlea. All right, so um, the, this was the plan for today. Um, and what I wanted to do um, in the very last little bit of the talk is to tell you a little bit about um, some of the current model shortcomings. Um, and we're running pretty close on time. So I'm just gonna give you a very brief taste of this um, and, and then I'll conclude. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, to talk about this a little bit because I think it is, it's, it's sort of tempting to kind of um, view all the stuff that I told you and to feel like you know um, the, these models are, are like perfect. Um, and they're, they're very clearly not. You know, they have like some, some pretty big holes in them and that's something that we're very interested in and kind of currently pursuing. Um, and so um, let me just give you the take home messages for the second part of the talk, and then I'll give you a little taste of the result. Um, and so the, um, the, the work that I will tell you about very briefly involves a method called metamers. Um, and we will, uh, we've, metamers are stimuli that produce the same responses in a model. So we've been using metamers of neural networks um, as a way to reveal their invariances. Um, and we, we find generally that metamers that we generate from deep layers of neural network models are not metameric for humans. Um, so this is a, a divergence with human perception. In fact, they're not even recognizable for humans. And this is true across modalities. We've had a little bit of luck in making the model metamers more human recognizable, um, but it's not, it's not solved by any means and, the, and very significant divergences remain. Um, so let me just give you a quick taste um, of this and then we'll, I will wrap up and we can have some discussion. So the classic example of metamers comes from color vision. So these two graphs show spectra of visible light. Um, the one on the left is from a tungsten bulb and the one on the right is a metameric match from a color monitor. And so you can see from looking at them that they're physically different. 
But if you were to show these as light sources to a human with normal color vision, they would look exactly the same. Um, and the reason for this is very well understood. And it's that you have three types of cones. And so that high dimensional spectra is getting projected onto a three dimensional subspace. And so it's inevitable that lots of things that are physically different in the high dimensional spectra space map to the same point in the three dimensional space of cone responses. Um, and once the, those cone responses are generated, like the information is lost, you can't get it back. Um, and so it's indistinguishable. Um, so that's the kind of classic application of, of metamers. I teach it every year when I teach color vision and undergrad perception. Um, but that the, the notion of metamers has been revived many times over the history of perception research, uh, was instrumental in thinking about texture perception. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, it was an important uh, development in the study of crowding. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's been an important idea for a long time. Um, and so we kind of thought that this might be a, an interesting way to look at representations of neural networks. And the, the basic logic behind this approach is that um, recognition tasks in perception, um, they're, they're difficult because there are like a lot of different examples of the, the same kind of thing that are physically very different. And so in order to recognize a word, you have to learn to become invariant to all the different sources of variation that can characterize the different instances of a different word. So the fact that, that my voice sounds different from Suresh's voice, um, and you know, if I'm happy, I'll say the word one way, if I'm sad, I'll say it another way. So there's all these, these, these things that can kind of produce differences in the acoustic signature of a word that you have to learn to kind of generalize across. And so it's natural to think that when we're training neural networks on these tasks and they end up kind of resembling humans, um, that they are kind of learning invariances that are sort of like the ones that, that humans have in their perceptual systems. And so we thought by generating metamers, um, we would uh, get some insight into these invariances, uh, potentially revealing the learned transformation and, uh, and being able to test uh, in another way whether the model captures human perception. And this is work in our lab that uh, is led, was led by Janelle Feather. Um, and the idea is really simple. Um, so we're gonna just take like a, a natural sound and look at the representation of that natural sound in the neural network. So it will produce some set of activations at some stage of the model. That's what's like indicated here. And so what we wanna do is just generate a signal um, that produces the same activations. Um, and so the way that we do that is we initialize a signal as noise, and then we just do gradient descent on the sound signal. So we set up a loss function um, that is a function of the difference between the model activations to this original sound and to the synthetic sound. Um, and then we do gradient descent on that. And there's now pretty straightforward methods for doing that. Okay, and so the, because we're dealing with these models that are feed forward and hierarchical, if you match the model's response at a given stage, all the subsequent stages are also matched and the model will make the same decision. Okay. All right, and so the point is that we are generating things that produce the same representation at one stage in a model um, and that the model should uh, and will think are the same thing. And the question is like, do these sound or look like the same thing to a human? Um, and this is what you get when you do this, okay? So these are metamers that are generated from a, a neural network that was trained to recognize words. And they, they are generated from each stage of the model from the very first convolutional layer um, up to the very last um, layer before uh, classification. Um, and the metamers here are being visualized um, in the cochlear representation. So we're looking at it in the time frequency plane. And what you can see is that the metamers from these early stages of the model, they look an awful lot like the original stimulus, but that as you move deeper into the model, they look less and less like the original. Okay, now on the one hand, that's kind of what you would expect if there's a model that is building up invariances, because the point is you would expect it to have metamers um, that are not that are deviating physically from the original. Okay, but the question is, are these things? Do they sound like the same thing to a human? All right, and if you're used to looking at spectrograms of speech, you'll probably be able to tell that the answer is no. Um, but I will just play you some examples here, um, and you can see for yourself. So these are metamers from the early stages. They sound kind of like the original. The job security program that prevents layoffs. So talking about job security, and I'll move deeper. The job security program that prevents layoffs. So you can already hear that starting to be noisy, but uh, sound noisy, but you can also still recognize the speech. We'll move deeper. Gets pretty hard, deeper still. And by the end, you really can't hear anything. Okay. Um, so I should emphasize, these are all signals that are fully recognizable to the neural network model, again, by design. 
Um, but as you can hopefully tell, they become progressively unintelligible to humans. Um, Janelle evaluates this with a recognition task. So she plays these sounds to humans and asks them to recognize the word. Um, and the results are shown here. So this graph is showing the proportion of stimuli that are correctly recognized. Uh, the, gray, the gray curve is what the model does. And as you would expect, it's doing fine across the board. But you can see that in, for human listeners, if you play them these signals, um, they're fine for metamers from the early layers, and then they get progressively worse um, as you generate them from the deeper layers. Okay. Um, so this phenomenon is not specific to auditory models. So you see the same thing if you do this in vision models. I mean, indeed, this phenomenon was something that people had kind of known about for a long time. People have been visualizing representations of neural networks for a long time. Um, but I think the significance of this for thinking about these as models of perception kind of went mostly unappreciated, and it had certainly never been measured. Um, but you see the same thing for models of vision. Um, so I just want to present this um, as a, what I think is a fairly striking contrast to everything that I showed you in the first part of the talk, where I gave you all these examples where the model is producing very similar behavioral results to humans. And that's generally true um, when you're presenting the model with natural sounds or with, with stimuli that were dreamed up by an experimenter to test some idea and so are still pretty naturalistic. You know, here we are generating sounds from the model um, and the sounds really deviate pretty substantially from natural audio and we get very divergent behavior. So it's a pretty substantial inconsistency with biological perceptual systems um, that we feel like we, we kind of need to understand. Um, so I'm running pretty short on time. So I, uh, there's a lot more that I could tell you about this. As I said, we've had a little bit of luck in making this better. Um, we haven't completely uh, fixed it by any means. Um, and so it's sort of an ongoing thing that we're kind of thinking about. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I wanna just conclude here. So let me just um, give you the top level summary, uh, which is that I, I told you a bit about our efforts to build new models of the auditory system uh, by applying deep learning to audio tasks. I showed you a bunch of examples of what I think are fairly compelling matches to human behavior with real world sounds and tasks. Um, and for many uh, classical psychophysical results, um, I showed you how we think this can give us insight into the origins of behavioral traits. Uh, it seems that many behavioral traits are primarily a consequence of natural task demands. Um, it also reveals dependence on aspects of peripheral pro processing. Um, and at the end, um, I showed you about some of the significant remaining discrepancies that are revealed by model metamers um, that we think will be important to confront and understand. So I just want to acknowledge um, the fantastic people that I get a chance to work with who did all this work. I told you a lot about the work of Alex Kell, Andrew Francel, Mark Sadler, um, Janelle Feather, um, Erica Shook, Ray Gonzalez, Dan Yamans. Um, and I didn't get a chance to tell you about um, the work that this, uh, these other folks have done, um, maybe for another time. Um, and I'll be happy to uh, take questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Josh. That was fantastic. Um, a question from Benjamin Rutsky. You want to ask the question, Benjamin? Yes, hi. So, my so very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. I just had a question about your sound localization models. So I was wondering if it's possible to construct models that are able to identify more sources in the human ear. And if so, could this be used to construct devices that could enhance human hearing? Yeah, well, you definitely can if you, uh, if you use more than two microphones. So the human auditory system is constrained by having two ears. Um, and so um, you can definitely do better if you use arrays of lots of microphones and that's you know, a pretty standard thing in the engineering world. Um, so that's the, definitely something that can be done. You know, we just haven't looked at that because we're mostly interested in building models of human hearing. Yeah, there were a couple of questions, uh, long questions from Puya actually, but he had to leave for another talk. He said it was a great talk. It was also a talk. So I let him ask you that separately. Um, I had some questions as well, since if there's no one else. Um, I, was I was really hoping to hear about the physiology, but I guess we'll have to wait for another talk. That was what was going through my head all the time. Do your units look anything like the brain? Uh, what's the brain score? Um, but I guess the other question that I could ask is, um, so the models that you're demonstrating, that you, you emphasize that there was no constraint on that on whether they match the human behavior or not. Uh, but did you actually choose the hyperparameters and structures uh, to optimize something else? Uh, I understand that once you chose the hyperparameters and structures, it's optimized for task performance. Uh, but in other words, which classes of models produce matches to human behavior, right? So if I change the structure of the network substantially, would that be affected? <laughs> 
Yeah, so the hyperparameters are just chosen to enable the model to do well on the training task. Um, okay. There are there are not really any other constraints, and like I mean, we definitely use you know common sense in sort of making those choices to some extent, but um, yeah, we we haven't really done any exploration of um, of whether there is some effect of the hyperparameters on the similarity to human behavior above and beyond like that that is explained on the effect on task performance yeah because um, that that effect on performances can be can, that can be significant yeah it's actually linked to what benjamin just asked as well in terms of nailing down exactly which features in the stimulus or in the model are causing this matching right so if in other words are there assumptions in the structure that are coming from the cnn choices that are actually uh, so one question was, you know, the, your, when you train the when you train the model on low frequency stimuli, on naturalistic stimuli, right? And then you get a good match on the psychophysics experiments. But the psychophysics experiments probably are also constrained to be ecologically valid, right? Not to use unreason, not really. No, no, the, I mean, okay. not at all, actually. I mean, the, there's plenty of stimuli in those experiments that are high pass. Okay. Um, okay. So it's um, yeah, it's it's not just that they're. I mean, I think you know, at some level. You know th that finding it is a reflection of the fact that in natural sounds the low numbered harmonics are carrying the most information because that's where the signal to noise ratio is highest you know and so the system really tunes into those yep um but it's um yeah there's plenty of stimuli in the experiment that are in absolute terms high frequencies so it's yeah. it's, it's a little it's more complicated than that I guess it could be interesting if you try to train another animal, right? Like a bat, for example, or try to reproduce another animal's psychophysics. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I mean, my suspicion is that you know, again, as long as you're, you have a system that really is sort of general in the sense that it's, it's got to really like process like natural sounds as opposed to some species-specific vocalizations like it will, you'd probably end up seeing some of these characteristics because the the low-pass characteristic of natural sounds. That is very, very common. You know, it's um, it's true that there are some species specific vocalizations that are very high frequency, but like most of the sounds that an animal is going to hear in the world will tend to be fairly low pass. You know, there's just yeah. there's a you know, yeah. Yeah, I just thought I'd sneak one more quick question in. What are the implications yeah. of the 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 you know the low pass filtering of the inner hair cell, like 50 hertz cutoff? Implications for spectral models of uh, harmonic tone complexes versus temp, uh, you know the temporal models. So are you saying that uh, you can say something to about that debate? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, I mean, spectral models are not gonna account for, for pitch perception, um, at least as, as classically conceived. I mean, you have to have phase locking in there if you're gonna get out human-like pitch discrimination, um, at, least, at least in our hands. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it is a very, it's pretty strong evidence that, that phase locking matters. I mean, it's not to say that like the place axis doesn't matter, right? I mean, the, you know, and of course, our model doesn't really, I mean, the model uses everything that there is to use in the cochlea, right? And like, yeah. you know, there's, I mean, place is part of that, right? But yeah, without the phase locking, you just can't get very, very far. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if there are other questions, I guess you can write to Josh or something, right? He, um, and uh, yeah, so thank you, everyone. And thanks, Josh, for the fantastic talk. My pleasure. Thank you.